Hi, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Ferrer. I am chief curator at BRIC, and I'm also the curator of the Latinx Abstract Exhibition, which is currently on view in Brick House in downtown Brooklyn. I'd like to acknowledge before we begin that I am currently in Western Massachusetts, home to the Muncie and to the Mohican people. I want to thank you very much for joining us this evening. We're going to hear from a few of the artists, look at some images of the show, and I hope at the end of this, uh, have a really good conversation about the exhibition. Now, one introductory note, as I think you can see, uh, you'll be able to make use of the captioning function of the Zoom platform simply by going to the CC icon that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And you can either turn closed captioning on or off, uh, whatever you prefer. Um, I'll warn you right now that it's not perfect. I, we are actually finding that it, it works pretty well, uh, but it does reflect BRIC's commitment to make our programs more accessible to a broader audience. So I hope that you find them um, helpful. I'm thrilled this evening to be joined by three really exceptional artists that I've had um, uh, just a wonderful time working with uh, throughout the development of this exhibition. Uh, and as we've been presenting it, uh, Candida Alvarez, Carlos Carcamo, and Rafael Vargas Suarez. Uh, they'll each be sharing some of their ideas about their practice, about the work that they have on view in the exhibition, and about abstraction itself and how they approach this visual language. Before they begin speaking, I want to tell you a little bit about the show. I know that many people have seen it, and that's really wonderful because this is the first show that we've had at, at BRIC uh, nearly in a year. But I also know that many of you haven't, and I hope some of you are joining us from out of town. So we will start with uh, a few slides, and I'll be able to kind of walk you through the exhibition uh, before we hear from the artists. So I curated this exhibition, and it's an exhibition of uh, 10 artists who are working in a wide range of media. Uh, because I wanted to challenge the established narrative of abstract art and its history in the United States. It's a narrative that has privileged certain voices over others and that essentially has excluded uh, Latinx artists and really all artists of color. But in fact, abstraction has, uh, well, let me just start again. And in fact, abstraction has often been overlooked also within the Latinx community in favor of other styles and approaches. Now, this exhibition purposefully includes emerging artists, as well as those who have been active for several decades, demonstrating the fact that abstraction is a vital and enduring aspect of Latinx artistic production. And abstraction has also been a rich terrain for these artists who speak to such issues as race, gender, historic and cultural legacies, science and popular culture, and many other topics through their work, as I think you'll hear about in just a moment. My hope is really that this exhibition will uh, encourage a reassessment, uh, not only of Latinx art and its scope and its uh, importance, but also of the history of abstraction itself in the United States. So I encourage you to see the exhibition. It's gonna be on view through May 2nd. You can make a reservation for a timed slot to visit on BRIC's website. Um, and you can also uh, take a look at the exhibition online. We'll be uh, loading up a lot of uh, uh, video and some other content soon. Uh, you can even soon sign up for a one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, Zoom uh, tour with one of our educators. So we're, that's something that we're doing that's new. So now let's look at this uh, brief video introduction that was made by Bricks TV team, and then I'll, I'll introduce the artist to you. I mean, it's amazing the lighting in here. <laughs> it's very different than my studio. like this sort of nice hanging here. The, the speaker in itself is a sculpture. It has a presence of its own, where when you see it, you know something is going to come out of it. Latinx Abstract highlights the work of 10 artists working with various approaches to abstraction, a vital but overlooked aspect of Latinx artistic production. In presenting this cross-generational survey of 10 artists, the exhibition challenges the established narrative of abstract art in the United States, one that has long privileged certain voices over others and that has essentially excluded the contributions of Latinx artists. The reason specifically that we use Latinx in the title, it's a gender neutral term. And so it's more encompassing of people that don't define themselves by a certain kind of gender or binary. 
for me, it sort of puts that positive stamp on who we are. And it's a term that, you know, it came from our community. And so I see it as forward looking and I see it as a term that is important because even though it represents a diversity of people, you know, we come from many countries. What we do have in common is that our histories and culture have been erased. And for me, Latinx is a very assertive term that aims to insert our history, our ideas, our values into the American landscape in the same way that I want to insert Latinx abstract art into the narrative on American abstraction more broadly. Thank you. So uh, now let's begin. I think that's a, a taste of the show, uh, uh, but we'll um, now continue with the artists. And I also want to mention that we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. So if you simply go to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, you can add in questions at any time and we'll get to as many as we can uh, once the three artists have spoken. Uh, we're going to first begin with Candida Alvarez. Uh, Candida was born in Brooklyn, actually very near Brook House. And she's based in, uh, in Chicago, where she holds the F.H. Sellers Chair in Painting at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Her work can be found in major museum collections, including the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and El Museo del Barrio, just to name a few. Her work has also been the subject, subject of extensive critical writing, most notably in the recently published book, Candida Alvarez Here, a Visual Reader, and most recently, Alvarez received the 2021 Hel Helen Frankenthaler Award for Painting. So thank you, Candida, for being with us this evening. Thank you. Um, it's been, it's a real pleasure to be here and I'm really quite happy to be back be, or represented in Brooklyn. Um, and, uh, and I also would like to acknowledge that I'm, I'm, I'm presently in Baroda, Michigan and um, certainly would like to uh, acknowledge the po Potawatomi uh, people. Uh, so with that, I just want to say um, uh, happy to be here and let's get the show on the road. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, first of all, these paintings that were included in the show are from a larger series of paintings that I call vision paintings. Um, and I really wanted to uh, begin with the year of 2020, because this, it's a very, it was a very special year to me. I mean, this whole idea of, uh, you know, when one says 2020 vision, one often thinks of perfect vision. And um, uh, there's, there's really no such thing as perfect vision in my mind, but uh, I thought it was a really good context to begin a body of work, to position it in this year, um, um, because it really, for me, really, aims at the eye, uh, which is the, for me, the main, one of the most important things about painting. Um, it's giving power to my eyes that, you know, comes through the mind and through the heart and through the body and, and all those other things. Um, and so um, can we have the next slide, please? So here's a closer view of the paintings. Um, this, I've worked smaller, uh, but, uh, but the range of my paintings go up to about six by seven feet. And, um, and working with these were just, it was just really special. Um, I reference a lot of subjects, but um, this in 20, the earlier part of 2020, um, I traveled to Umbria and, uh, I got to see a lot of work by Piero della Francesca, somebody, who, oh, oh, an artist whose work I really uh, admired and, and had been looking at for many years. And so I came back to uh, the studio and some of those things that I saw and, and that color was became part of some of this work. And so that's one aspect of this. And the other is, uh, the other artist I really have been thinking a lot about is uh, Francisco Yell, uh, an artist who um, uh, is from and worked in Puerto Rico. And uh, he was one of the earliest painters that I remember seeing. 
And I remember being so proud of the fact that he was from Puerto Rico and that he was, ma he was making these really huge paintings. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, I think, well, it's not, no, it's, the, we'll go back to it later. But I, I just wanna say that I do have an example of the painting that I was looking at, but let me just move back a little bit and go to these paintings, which um, I, where I've introduced a structure, uh, a sort of, you know, paintings with little feet almost. Uh, uh, so, and these started with PVC material. It was a part of a show that I had at Monique Meloche Gallery. Um, uh, and uh, it was special, they were special because they came, they started out um, from, a, uh, I had a commission uh, by the Chicago um, D case and they were um, this, this very large printed piece uh, made of four parts was displayed under the bridge, the Wacker Bridge in, um, in Chicago, uh, Michigan Avenue. And that led to this. Um, 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 there's a front and a back or, or a flip side, um, not really front and back. They're just the kind of a double-sided um, views. Um, and also because they're pixelated, um, uh, you know, the, the material itself allows light to come through. And so it also brings in the space that they're, they're um, uh, being uh, shown in. And so I really like that idea that I, uh, for the first time, I've actually made paintings that don't hang on the walls, that they have the support structure that holds them up. Um, uh, okay, let's move to the next one. And this is actually the first one I did in the in that whole sort of series. Um, and it's actually now on view at a Museo de Barrio. And fortuitously, the opening, their opening is tonight, I think virtual openings are tonight also. So heads off to them. And um, this one um, was made uh, just after the hurricane uh, Maria took place. And it was, it just gave me, um, an opportunity to work in a very different way. Unlike the vision paintings that you saw earlier, which are more traditional linen and acrylic, you know, for me on stretchers, on, on aluminum stretchers, these, this was very different. I worked on the wall and the floor and I almost scrubbed the paint in to the little crevices that was of, that were part of this PVC material. So, um, it was a whole different experience, and because of this, you know, this whole this whole passage in time, uh, and sort of thinking about Puerto Rico and all of and all of the people that I couldn't find my mother, my sister, you know, so on and so forth. There was uh, my father had just passed too, so there was a lot of stuff going on, and so I had the opportunity to work in this manner, and um, it was quite a surprise. It took me a while to figure out how I was going to present them. I didn't really think I was going to be showing this work, um, but uh, you know, this is this is where um, this took me. So, can we have the next slide, please? And so, this is the other side of of the uh, painting, and I really liked what was going on. Um, that it was transparent uh, and yet opaque, and that there was light. Um, and uh, there was space. Uh, so I think that this is a way of working that I'm still sort of thinking about because it's so new in a way. Um, and I was so fortunate to have, to be able to show them what I did. Um, and uh, so anyway, next slide. Uh, so this is, I referenced Francisco Yell, and here he is. Uh, this was the painting that I, that I saw many years ago. I think it was in the 80s. It was um, in New York, uh, or it was either Puerto Rico or New York. There was a big show that was organized uh, with the Met and um, and Museo de Barrio and uh, the, the uh, Puerto Rican Center the cultural center uh, in, I think in San Juan. Um, and so um, this was, this is a really large painting and I remember looking at it and it was so mysterious. And this is also about the dying, the death, celebrating the death of a child. And so um, it's called a velorio and, um, and because, 
you know, there's so much that we've all been going through with the pan, you know, with COVID, um, with this idea of death and um, not being able to mourn uh, people because you can't get, you know, you couldn't get close, you couldn't go there to see them. I mean, it just, it just kind of became this painting that I was being very, allowed me a lot of reflection. And, and also because of the pandemic, I couldn't go out and, you know, I, 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 was, I was working at home for a while. Uh, I couldn't even get to my studio. So um, when you work with, with technology, digital technology, I mean, there's something about being able to uh, project something and to really be able to see it intimately. You know, there's something about getting very close to something. And um, so in many ways, my camera lens can devour the this, this, this shapes and spaces in this particular painting or any other or anything that I want to look at. So um, I don't always just reference paintings, but because I also reference photographs uh, taken by family or friends or myself or whatever's at hand. Um, but I would say that this, uh, I mean, I've really managed to look at this painting very carefully over several works. Um, and it's really about trying to understand how he composed uh, also. And it's not just a subject but it's about life too. And so I'm sort of very interested in, um, in that. And I, I've, I fundamentally, I don't really see divisions between abstraction and figuration. And so for me, it really is this space um, that is alive. And um, it kind of goes back, I would say to, you know, uh, growing up in the projects in Brooklyn um, and Brick is not too far away from where I grew up. I lived in the Farragut projects for many years and then moved to a little house on Front Street. And my studio was on John Street, which is very close. And um, so I would say that looking out those windows on the 14th, the last, the top floor really gave me a sense of wonder. And um, it would allow me to look out and sort of see the sky and see the highway and see the trees and see the people. But all of a sudden they became this, Thing that was framed within a, a you know rectangle, um, and so for me, I really feel that that was probably the first time that I can really say that um, perhaps that you know there was something there was something about that that I that I have throughout my life brought with me. So, and that is that um, uh, that that practice for me really is. Um, somewhere between something you you are in the midst of and something you notice and something you search for. Um, so I don't know if there's another slide. Is there another slide? Yes, there is. So uh, this is a, a painting um, that, uh, a fresco that was in Umbria that is by Piero della Francesca. And I was so, I mean, it's such a beautiful painting. Uh, and the, the way, the fact that it lives so many, you know, centuries later. And so uh, uh, that I just, it was how I, it was, I used this for the first uh, vision painting um, that I began uh, in 2020. So how do I use it? Well, I just kind of hone in uh, to some of the shapes and uh, it's, it's uh, bits and pieces that I uh, begin with. And, uh, and then I take it from there. So uh, I think that's it, right? <laughs> yeah, I think it is. I think that's the last slide. Thank you very much, Candida. You're very welcome. So we're gonna continue uh, with Carlos Carcamo. Um, Carlos was born in El Salvador, was raised in Queens, and he's now based in Beacon, New York. In his paintings and sculpture, he creates a dialogue between concepts drawn on the one hand from areas like rap and hip hop culture, and on the other from the high modernist realms of geometric abstraction, cubism, and color field expressionism. Carlos has exhibited uh, internationally and locally, locally at Artist Space, the Brooklyn Museum, MoMA PS1, El Museo del Barrio, and the Queens Museum, among many others. So Carlos, I'll now turn it to you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, 
Um, I, I want to first start off by saying that, you know, it's exciting to be part of the, this ex ex important exhibition. Um, I also want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from Wappingers Falls, uh, home to the Wappingers tribe. I think, I guess they were part uh, Lenape and Mohican. But um, like Elizabeth was saying, um, I want to give a little bit of my background because it's very important to the context of my work. Um, I was born in El Salvador. Uh, my family moved to uh, Jamaica, Queens, New York when I was five years old. Um, so by the time I entered my early teens, early 80s, um, hip hop was just explo exploding uh, on the scene all over New York City. So of course I, I kind of became part of it. Um, I was an active graffiti writer from like, I'm guessing 1981 to about 1986, 87. Um, by the end of the 80s, I moved to Miami for a couple of years where I studied commercial art um, and doing an assignment for an art history class. I was sent to the University of Miami uh, to see an exhibition. And of course, um, it was it happened to be a traveling exhibition of pop art. Um, and, and that's where I encountered the work of Robert Rauschenberg. And right away, I was taken by his work. I, it reminded me of the grittiness of New York. And, but especially what was important for me was that it, um, his use of collage and, and, and incorporating everyday materials into his work, into the composition of his pictorial space. So um, over time, you know, when I moved back to New York and I, I decided to pursue fine arts, um, I began to think as collage as a form of sampling. Um, and and I, I began to think that, um, that you know, I could use I could use the constructed constructed nature of urban culture as sort of a, both a conceptual and a, and a, and as a way a, a formal process in creating work. Um, I don't know. I, I don't see any slides, so oh, there they are. So uh, you know, um, to this day, that that's the sort of the core. Um, uh, element in my work. I, I also in incorporated graffiti, which was part of my own personal history. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Um, maybe another slide. I want to show the process uh, a little bit. And so um, the way I, I make my paintings is I begin by, you know, laying down a, a, a layer of paint and of color. And then I tag the, the, the name case on it, which is a homage to uh, the legendary graffiti writer Case Two, um, who was a, sort of the king of, of style in the 70s and 80s. Um, and I also am interested in using that, the name because it flows really well across the canvas. Um, it covers like, you know, the entire um, canvas. And, and then I use graffiti removal products and start to remove the, the graffiti tag. And what I'm left with uh, is the ghost print of the tag but also because I have to press really hard to remove the tag, I also get the impression of the, of the stretcher bars of the painting, which I, it's an element that I like. And then I build the surface of the painting. Can you go to the next slide? I build up the surface of the painting with, uh, uh, you know, uh, very trans, um, thin layers of either various different colors or I use the same color um, until I get to a point where I feel like the painting has, become its own sort of thing. I, you know, if the, if the work, um, because I'm using a process that's very similar to what you see on the streets where somebody tags on a wall and then it gets painted over. If, if it resembles a trompeloid version of that, then I'm not, I, I feel the painting is not working. I, I feel like I keep, I keep you know, um, adding layers and, remove, and using the graffiti remover until I get to a point where um, it's just the painting um, becomes, I, I don't know, there's a pictorial space that I'm sort of interested in. It's almost like I think of it as a vandalized pictorial space. And then I build, I continue building the surface of the painting using um, elements that I find. And that's where the sort of the collage element from my influence of Rosenberg still continues, which is that uh, if you could see on the left, um, there's little bits of paint skin and drip marks. So a lot of times when you see those marks on my paintings, they seem like they're um, intentional, but they're actually placed. Um, I, I usually uh, collage them on using matte medium. Um, and then um, I frame the work uh, with using reclaimed uh, plywood. 
um, that, that you know, I salvage. And sometimes the color of the painting um, is influenced by the markings on the, on the frame. And, and for me, the framing of the work is part of the work, but also acts as a, con a contextual device to, that informs um, the, you know, that informs the work as existing um, within the space and, and being informed by everyday life. And, and, and I think, I guess for me, abstraction, my interest in, in abstraction is that, you know, is challenging that, this idea that of, of purity and also the, the idea of, of abstraction, the history of abstraction um, and it's, it's um, an exclusion, ex excluding everything that is not, you know, that, that I guess um, it being art about art. And I feel like um, my work is more about art, about life, um, bringing in elements of, of everyday um, of the everyday world into into the, the work and also you know incorporating elements of my own personal um, you know ex experience and, and life um, and so um, you could see on the left there that the, the, the that painting the blue painting I, it's in the brick exhibition um, that painting is the color of that painting was informed by the, actually by the framing um, and sometimes you know um, I, my use of color is, is, is uh, uh, chosen randomly, but other times it's very specific. So um, I guess that's, that's it. I guess there's another image there of, of the painting with a tag. Thank you very much, Carlos. And there we see the, the completed painting. So I think we're going to move on to Rafael Vargas Suarez. Um, Rafael, who uh, goes by the name in his artwork as Vargas Suarez Universal, was born in Mexico City. He was raised in Houston, and he now works between New York and Kyrgyzstan, which is in Central Asia. Since childhood, he has been fascinated with space travel, astronomy, and our relation to the cosmos, interest that he reflects in paintings, textile-based works, and sound recordings. In addition to exhibiting internationally, uh, he has had major commissions for his work, and most recently, uh, he will be returning to Kyrgyzstan, I think very soon, to design the new History Museum of the Uranium Industry. Uh, so uh, with that, I will now pass it to you, Rafael. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, thanks for everybody for being here virtually. I'm actually uh, in JFK Airport, which is on land that is home of the Lenape people. And I'm actually at the airport because I am, as Elizabeth mentioned, heading back to Kyrgyzstan tonight for um, what is related to actually pieces on the show. Uh, the artworks in the exhibition were made in Kyrgyzstan, the textile pieces, the wool pieces, the floor piece, and two of the wall pieces. And these are works that are handmade. Um, they're using techniques that are recognized by the UN as intangible cultural heritage of the Kyrgyz people in the Kyrgyz culture. And their images, the shapes, the designs of themselves come from my long interest since childhood, growing up in the NASA community, being interested in technology, being interested in information, and being interested in how the history of technology information has been represented through its visual syntax. So by way of drawing, by way of understanding mathematics, I've somehow developed my own, uh, my own, in a way, style, I guess you could say signature style. Um, the basic general unit that I use is called a vector, which is in mathematics is basically the line from point A to point B. Um, in my work, I use it as either a positive or a negative shape or space. And that's allow, that allows me to really replicate, manipulate, um, fold, unfold, and create structures. Mostly I've been dealing with two dimensionality, but little by little I'm moving into 3D architectural commissions. And, and now in the studio, uh, we're doing 3D architectural modeling of my work instead of our pure architecture. So using architectural programs 
to create 3D models of what could potentially be 3D printing, casting, mechanisms, or sculpture, wall reliefs, and architectural elements. Next slide. This is a very funny thing that Elizabeth and the team at Brick chose the painting to be in the show. This is called Virus Americanus number no. five. It's from a series that I made just before September 11, um, the summer of 2001. I was very interested in this visualization approach to things, something like a computer virus. I was using the word virus um, in very metaphorical terms, but it became almost like political using the red, white, and blue. So I ended up calling the series Virus Americanus, American virus in Latin. And it's very funny because this painting is now 20 years old. Um, it was, it's been in a few shows uh, in the last few years. So it just keeps kind of coming back out of its uh, dormant state, so to speak. Next slide. These are two pieces uh, made recently in Kyrgyzstan this past 2020. Um, I had a very interesting and difficult year like most people. And I was actually working uh, in Kyrgyzstan remotely with people in Kyrgyzstan because they closed down the borders of the seven states. So the women that I work with and the communities are, that I work with on the textile pieces are very been very rural areas. And so we were communicating through phone and through text messaging and images. And finally, when they uh, closed down, when the lockdowns ended, I was able to finally see some of the first pieces in person, which then helped all of us decide what the next pieces should be and continue the process. Uh, all the materials and the process are totally organic. Uh, very raw natural materials, but also we use techniques that are, again, they're centuries and some of them thousands of years old, but they're zero waste. They're, it's all about sustainability. And so you actually get two for one in terms of material. You cut out a pattern, you cut out a shape and you get a positive and a negative, which suits my work very, very well. Since for many, many years, I was drawing in a way that I'm creating positive and negative layers and shapes. Next slide. This was a picture that I took of one of the pieces um, that's in the show. That's actually at Lake Isikul, uh, the jewel of, of Central Asia, we call it. It's a beautiful lake. It's the second highest alpine lake in the world after Lake Titicaca in Bolivia and Ecuador, uh, Peru. And um, I really wanted to be back outside. This is just after a lockdown. As soon as the, the second lockdown was, was ended, it was announced that it was ending. I was so eager to get back outside, be out in the nature, be out in the lake. And I took some of the first finished pieces and I photographed them and really their, their environment and their ecosystem. The dyes that we work with are vegetable dyes that come from plants, fruits, vegetables, uh, herbs, some flowers. So depending on the color, you know, there, there's, a, there's a source for each of the colors. And I work with natural light painting and, and, and in these works. So for me, working in natural light conditions is very much has to do with the materiality of things, but also looking at these things and photographing them in natural light. It's, it's just like it's true, true color. Next slide. Uh, this is a little bit of some pictures in the studio, just really learning about how to piece these things together, how cut out pieces of felt, how to puzzle them together, how it's going to work, how they're going to be layered. You know, there's so many different techniques because what you want to do is you want to have a piece that's strong, that's going to last a long time, it being an organic material. So I, I've worked with several masters and in the beginning, it's interesting because they're very reluctant to trying something new. And then eventually they just really, really get into it. And you can tell by the end that there's a lot of pride there's a lot of history and there's a lot of uh, tradition that I'm honoring that tradition by working with them, but also learning from them and they're learning from me. So it's very much a back and forth. I'm teaching them things that they have no idea about and vice versa. Next slide. And this is just a typical picture in the studio uh, in 
Brooklyn and in New York uh, from a series where I'm tracing, this is like the opposite in the technology, but very much related line work based on the movement of, of astronauts and cosmonauts in space. And so this idea of always following a line, always this thread, I call it, you know, the thread of time, the thread of space, the thread of life, just always following it and seeing where it takes me. Next. And this is a recent painting uh, that was finished right around Christmas time in, in Kyrgyzstan. This is called uh, Stargazers. And the forms come actually from Mayan obsidian sculptures of Mayan astronomers looking up at the sky. And so I wanted to try a painting version of it. I'd never seen a painting version of this subject matter. So I decided to do these three forms. And uh, this is a big oil on linen painting. Next. And this is also in the studio in Kyrgyzstan with some of my assistants um, working in a very fun and very kind of relaxed atmosphere. Um, we just, there's a lot of trust between when I work with people. I, I, in a way it's like I'm their teacher, but they also teach me about, you know, how they would do things. And so in the studio, we have a lot of dialogue that is just back and forth, very open. I always tell them, don't be afraid to say what you think, what you feel, what you want to, what we should try. And, you know, it's just very much, I, I, I keep a very open-minded attitude in the studio. Next. That's it, yeah. Thank you, Rafael. Mm -hmm. I actually would like to follow up. We're going to now move to questions and answers. So just a reminder to please put your cute, your questions in the chat and we will get to them. Um, but, you know, one of the things that you and I have talked about a few times is about this sort of dynamic about going back and forth in time. You know, you use these ancient techniques, these uh, very traditional materials, and then your work is also dealing with ideas about, you know, vectors and physics and computer languages. And I was wondering if you could just talk about um, that movement that you make in your work between his history and tradition and more kind of future looking languages and technology. Yeah, you know, it's, it's something that I didn't realize for quite a long time until you start looking back a little bit and you start seeing why you did what you did and how things are connected and what connects them. And I think that what's happened to me um, creatively in the last say five to 10 years, I've always traveled a lot. I love traveling. I love learning about other people, other cultures, other ideas. But then being in Central Asia, traveling throughout Siberia and lots of places in Europe, I started thinking about um, you know, how ideas migrate, how things move, why they become what they become, not only in technology and in science, but just socially and culturally. And so I started realizing that technology or things like our screens, our laptops, our phones, you can trace those technologies back to textile work textile arts from all over the world, in Peru, in the Middle East, and in, in, you know, in Central Asia, and all over the world. So I feel like I'm just connecting the dots that haven't really been so obvious to connect. Thank you. Hey, Candida, I have a question for you. Um, so, you know, we share this great love for Piero della Francesca. I also made a, a pilgrimage a few years ago to Umbria and tried to see as many paintings as I, I could. And I remember that one especially. Um, I, when I was looking at that painting and the color, I was thinking about the colors that you use, like the, the, all the blues in the 20 by 20 series. And I was just wondering how you develop your palette, uh, especially for those paintings where there's so many colors and how you're able to develop a palette with so many related tones, like all the all the blues and the greens in that series? Um, I do it in many different ways. I would say, I mean, what I take is, yeah, I start with, you know, I was sort of thinking about those colors uh, with, you know, a few of those paintings, um, but it kind of keeps evolving. Um, I sort of, 
I kind of have a sense about a, a kind of way I want to go uh, or a kind of mood I want to evoke. Um, sometimes it's very organic, but sometimes it's, you know, it's, um, it's trying to get a certain movement in the painting. So, I mean, the blues, you know, there are moments when I get attracted to, to the color. So the ultramarine blue was a color, for example, that I hadn't really used a lot. Um, and, um, and all of a sudden it just felt like the right color to use and it gave me a depth. Um, and so I was, I, I didn't want to use, I was actually really, uh, the linen color was what I was really relating to um, for, uh, I guess for the, I want to say a couple of years now, uh, so that I'm not starting off with a white, you know, that, uh, that's been, uh, that's been gessoed on. I'm really working with the color of the material. So that creates a kind of grayscale. I mean, that starts, that gives you a value that, you know, I'm sort of relating to with the rest of the painting. So that's been a, a challenge, but also it's been a lot of fun too. And so in all of those works, they're like little windows opening up to the color. And so the color of the linen is also becomes a color that of the palette itself. So, um, and so it's just, a, it's a way of building up to something, you know, that, that I find uh, interesting. Uh, and um, it's something that the color just gives me and I can't always put it into words how it, how it really happens. It just kind of, um, the painting kind of takes me to where it needs to go. And so we fight sometimes <laughs> and sometimes we don't, um, but, Piero was like a beginning point point for me. That painting that I showed, I mean, that painting, when you, you the more you look at that painting, it's really this gaze that I'm so, you know, it, the gaze of that, of her face, you know, is such a beautiful gaze and it almost, you could, you know, you can think, well, what is that gaze about? Well, maybe that's our gaze. Like that's the, you know, the artist gaze in a way, you know, we're sort of, we're sort of trying to figure something out or um, seeing it in the work um, or tracking it through the work. Um, and so it was, it was mysterious to me, you know, I mean, the painting is quite mysterious, uh, but the color, you know, the grounding of the color, right? Cause it was so natural. It was like a tree. <laughs> it was like a landscape, really. The colors are so beautiful that, um, you know, they're so bright. Uh, and uh, so I don't know. I mean, there's something about getting brightness against the linen color, you know, that color that is so kind of muted um, and not starting off with something lighter. So it, it was not easy to do, but I just felt like it was the right thing to do. So, uh, and it took me through, you know, I, feel, I see like 20 steps, you know, 20 pages. <laughs> steps and each one was always a surprise because I'm always looking to be surprised right I'm not I'm not I don't always I'm not predicting what the painting is going to look like you know nor do I always know where what it's going to look like I just kind of have a sense about what I wanted to do um and so I'm always you know I mean that's the sense of wonder for me in it but I am very attracted to this manipulation of color, right? It's a real science and alchemy too, at the same time. And so, um, you know, you can be very assured with it, but then it also gives you surprises. Um, you know, when you use that color, that's the neutral ground, it, in one light, it's one particular tone. When it when you pair it up with two other colors, it starts to shift, and and I'm really intrigued by that. What what I sort of sort of always used in my other my earlier paintings, I always had like a beginning point, which was like the navel. You know, it's where the painting kind of begins, and um, so I'm very intrigued by how composition works and how color. You know, sort of, I mean, the more formal things that, that one, you know, the more formal challenges and sort of um, uh, reasons why one wants to paint, you know, other than trying to convey something, you know, in terms of its subject or, you know, there's so many layers to painting for me. It's, a, um, it's um, it has to be challenging and it has to be surprising. Thank you. Thank you. 
So Carlos, we're also we're also going to talk about color. Uh, you showed briefly the gold painting, and yeah. I was fascinated when you told me the background about that work and how it really kind of again it connects to real life. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, that painting. You know, my paintings tend the process of my paintings tend to seem like they're very quick, um, but they actually there's a certain part of my process that is quick, but then I live with the work for a period of time. And that's that painting originally was a light, sort of a light brown painting. And I thought it was finished, but for a long time, I just kept living with it. And, um, you know, I work as, at MoMA, so <laughs> I'm a picture framer. And I was sent to the conservation department to during, in 2019 to reframe uh, uh, Andy Warhol's Marilyn. And while I was there, I was looking at the surface and it's a gold painting. And so when I came back home and I went in my studio, I just decided that, you know, maybe this painting needs, you know, a layer of gold, gold. And that's, you know, so I applied the gold and I instantly knew that the painting was finished. And of course that led to um, me thinking, well, Andy Warhol had a silver double Elvis in the MoMA collection. And so, I decided to make, which is um, the silver painting that's hanging in at Brick. Um, so those two paintings are very specific. I mean, I, I, you know, I normally don't, I'm not normally that specific. Sometimes color is influenced by like maybe the, some, some marking on the, on the frame that I'm using, or sometimes it's just um, spontaneous. I just choose a color. But in those two paintings, they were very specific. Um, they came from, you know, art reference. And, um, you know, I'm not so much interested uh, in, in the use of appropriation as sort of, I use it in, in the sense like, you know, the way I, I guess um, sampling is used. It's, it's just used as a tool to build upon. It's not really uh, used, I, I, when I think of appropriation, the way appropriation is used in the, in the art context, it's almost like a term that's used as a form of criticality um, or to make a specific statement. For me, it's more like I'm just, you know, a painting can have multiple influences and references. And for me, in the same way that, you know, you know you're know, you using, you know, bits and pieces of, of different musical, uh, you know, bits and pieces of music to create a whole composition. And so um, I guess that's where the, go the two gold, the gold and the silver that are in the brick exhibition um, came about. Thanks. They're, they're beautiful paintings. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we're now going to move to questions from our audience. There's a few now. Um, uh, Raphael, uh, Michelle Fader Nadoff asks, what are the ethics of using traditional artisans and also artisan assistants as anonymous makers? What makes this work go beyond a colonial relationship? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's something I asked myself in the very beginning of going to Kyrgyzstan and Really, I went there not because I was looking for a place to go really work beyond the commission that I was that I was granted um, for the American University campus. While I was there working on that project for two years, I peripherally kept looking at and wondering and admiring the textile work, you know, being in the middle of the Silk Road, I quickly realized that that history, those traditions, or something I wanted to learn. So basically I became an apprentice to masters um, for, I mean, I consider myself a student for life. I'm still learning many, many things. So by the time I was able to learn about techniques, try things myself, really understand, really dive into not only in the studio, but having these people be a part of my life, knowing their families, the kids, the grandkids, the neighbors, the dog, the sheep, the horses, um, you know, by the time I really became part of their family, part of that community, I felt like, okay, I can start doing my, my work and people wanted to work for me. People really, they, they still call me. I get messages and calls. I want to work for you. I want to learn from you. And that relationship, I don't see it as any kind of colonial or anything. I mean, I'm, I'm in their lives. They're in my lives. Um, I have upwards sometimes of up to 20 or 30 people, you know, helping them pay off a house, 
send kids to school. I'm really part of their lives. And that, what it gives me back, yes, we produce artworks, but the relationships I've been able to build, um, I, I mean, I have a whole new set of friends for life. You know, at age 40, 45, how many people get to have a whole new set of friends for life? So I feel like it's a two way, it's a two way street. They, they, I, the work gets a lot out of it and they get a lot out of it. We just, it's, I see it as a collaboration. Even from the beginning, it was a, a dialogue that I, I didn't know where it was gonna take me, but I just follow the, how the work develops and you know, we'll see where that goes. But there's a lot of relationships that, that really um, have evolved and are still evolving. That are very beautiful. I, I love I love the, the families that I that I've gotten to live with. Thank you, Rafael. Mm -hmm. um, Candida, there's a question from Sarah Brook, um, who would like you to talk about the similarities between abstraction and figuration, in the way a work on a plane, as you said, comes alive. Um, okay, I I did write to her back, but anyway, um, well, I wanted to, everybody to hear. I, don't, I can't even see what I wrote, but anyway, um, 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 when, you know, when bodies come together, when it's, you know, you think about Mirandi, Mirandi in his paintings, you know, the bottles, you know, he always talked about that space between those bottles, right? That's what his focus was. I mean, bodies in space, um, you know, we see, we see because of what is next to, next, like you see me because there's something next to me, you know, there's a, there's a space, there's a shape. And so that, I like, I like placing that as the positive, right? So it's kind of switching uh, things around. And so it's hard, you know, it's just, it's just the way I see things, right? It's kind of wonky. It's kind of like clear sometimes. Uh, sometimes it becomes, I, I use the color more systematically. Sometimes I don't, I, you know, it goes awry. Um, I've, I've made paintings where I just noticed things that come through the window, you know, in the studio, like rainbows, or, you know, I've noticed the sunset and I've used the colors of the sunset or tried to really, you know, um, um, so this idea of positive negative, right? It, it's like, it flip flops. So the body's not always the dominant, you know, the, the wall could be dominant, right? Uh, it's just, it's just the way I merge things around so that, um, not, um, there's no hierarchy and, um, just like, you know, uh, the history of painting, art history is not the dominant, you know, there's also life history. So, so I kind of feel like I can use whatever I want. And so <laughs> sometimes it's parts of the hand, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's part of a face, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's parts of a flower, you know? I mean, I just kind of use what I need. And uh, I don't know I'm gonna need it until I need it. So uh, it seems, I just like the space to be alive. And so I don't follow any rules, really. I just, I, um, but I try to dismantle uh, um, a kind of hierarchy about what's more important, you know, in a way, um, pictorially. So everything matters. Um, um, and it's, it's for me as the, as the painter in the room, as the artist in the room to sort of, um, juggle things around, right? And so uh, it takes a long time to believe in one's vision, right? And then you, you don't give it up, right? And you don't want it to fall out. It's something about the mystery, right? And, Thank you. Yeah. Well, we're getting near eight o'clock, but there's one question that comes from Linda Arioli, Ariola, who, um, is to everybody. So I thought maybe we could end if we could just um, each address this. Um, many Latin ex exhibitions have themes or imagery that place us squarely within the Latino experience. How do you think Latinx abstract is uniquely Latino? Can I jump into that? 
Yes, absolutely. I, I think that each each one of us, all the artists in the show, and of course any Latinx artist out there who's dealing with any form of abstraction, your life experience is the work. Your your thoughts, your ideas, your visions. Your it could be that some of us are immigrants, some of us are first generation Americans, some some of us are world travelers, some of us. I think that just our life experience goes into the work, and you know that that's that that's it's going to be a very broad and very diverse way of, of thinking about it but i think it's our life experience individually our unique visions i think i agree with that <laughs> yeah <laughs> we're, we're living beings and uh uh we you know we come we come with everything that we have and so that you can't put us in a box yeah, I almost feel like I, I, I guess I got to clarify a little bit of what I said at the end that about art, about art and art about life. It, it, what I really meant by that was more that art being informed by art that, that excludes everything outside of that. And for me, my work is about art informed by life. And so my own personal experiences and everyday world. And so, you know, that includes being Latinx. So. And it's also generational, you know, every, you know, it's like every couple of years, you know, it feels like, well, you know, in the eighties, it was, it was something else, you know, so it's kind of a, it's about a place and a time, you know, uh, and so I'm just happy that I can cross all the, I've been able to cross, you know, different generations, right, and I, you know, and heads up to teaching and being around, you know, all kinds of people, you know, I mean, it opens you up to so many dimensions. You know, um, we, we, we're we not one type, you know, we don't fit this one sort of cliche, you know, we are expansive, we are life itself, you know, we are, we bring what we, what we um, want to bring, what we, what we value, what we, you know, like and dislike, you know, I mean, I think it's just, it's just uh, an acceptance, you know, that, that we're, that this is all valuable, you know, amazing, you know, mysterious landscapes that, you know, that are still being discovered and sort of let, you know, uh, uh, allowed to sort of be part of a conversation that's been big for a long time, you know. So yeah, and I guess I would just also add to that, that, um, you know, Latinx artists, African-American artists have often been there's often been this imposition, this expectation that they would represent race or culture in their work. And that seems to be sort of the, the comfortable sphere in which these artists are, are able to operate in the art world. And, you know, uh, artists, whether Latinx or African-American or whatever background, you all have the freedom to create and just the freedom to work with whatever approach that, that um, you're interested in, that you're drawn to. Um, nobody owns abstraction. And in fact, um, abstraction has a very long history in the Americas. Um, I think at least two artists in the exhibition are really directly thinking about the legacy of Andean cultures or pre-Columbian cultures for which abstraction was, was common. And so in a certain sense, we could say we're drawing you know, from, from our own culture. Um, and I just think that what, for me, what was so exciting to work with all of you is this sense of freedom that you bring to your work and the, um, all, the, all the, the great number of influences that you draw on to create, uh, for me, what is just this very rich body of work that I feel like for you and other, the other artists in the show and other Latinx artists who are not in the show, for me, it's just this really, um, it's just this open terrain for more exploration. Um, so with that, I wanna thank you, uh, uh, Rafael and Candida and Carlos for joining us this evening. Um, this has been really illuminating. I just wanna add that on March 24th at 7 p.m., NYU professor and author Arlene Davila will moderate a, the panel Latinx Artists in the Art World, Marketplaces and Museums. And she'll be joined by three other artists in the exhibition, Gwendolyn Medina, Mary Valverde, and Sarah Zapata. And then on April 14th, the artist Alejandro Guzman will perform Return of the Intellectual Derelict with one of his sculptures that's on exhibition at Brickhouse. We'll be for filming that performance without an audience, but you'll be able to stream it live on YouTube. So 
I hope you'll join us for both of these events and you can register by going to our website and I hope to see you there. So thank you all again very much for being with us this evening and have a good rest of your evening. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> thank you.